All right, welcome. You guys are all diehards in the last um, session of the day, in the last session of the conference, right? Has everybody been enjoying this as much as I have? It's pretty spectacular, I have to say. Um, my name is Lisa Tasker, and I am with the Pitkin County Healthy Rivers Program, and I am going to introduce all our wonderful speakers here this afternoon. Um, the first person I'd like to introduce is somebody that uh, my program has interacted with for the last eight years, we just decided. <laughs> um, Quinn Donnelly, he is, um, uh, he's been doing incredible work as a river engineer for the Pitkin County Healthy Rivers Program since uh, eight years ago. <laughs> he works for River Restoration out of Carbondale, Colorado, and has done that for the last 16, is that 16 years? Yep. Um, and he's done a broad range of water resource projects. It's not, not only as a, a river engineer, but a project manager. Um, the last eight have been hyper-focused on river and stream projects. Congratulations on that, which is we're all happy that he's doing that because I can tell you that um, Quinn is an absolute wonderful person to work with, and he has really helped explain a lot of things to our board that um, are difficult concepts sometimes for them to grasp. Um, He's also um, not only registered in Colorado as an um, engineer, but also in Iowa and Utah. Welcome up, Quinn Donnelly. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Like, like she said, my name's uh, Quinn Donnelly. work uh, out of Carbondale for River Restoration. Uh, first off, Lisa, thanks for moderating uh, this session. Thanks for all of you for attending. Um, so I'm here today to talk about a project that Pickens County just built in 2021. Um, it's a diversion on the main stem of the Roaring Fork River um, called the Robinson Diversion. So uh, before we get into the details, I just kind of wanted to go through all the team members. Of course, the Healthy Rivers Board was a, a key player and uh, Lisa McDonald here uh, in the room was a, a driving force behind the project. Um, and, uh, and then we also worked a lot with the Mid Valley Metro District and the Robinson Ditch Company who uh, own and operate the Robinson Diversion. Um, the design team was ourselves and then uh, we did you know, most of the design, did hydroelectric survey, planning, permitting, all that fun stuff. And then uh, DHM Design did our aquatic resource delineation and the reporting which was crucial for uh, getting our 404 permit with the Corps. And then SGM um, did the structural design uh, and the construction oversight for the head gate itself. Um, Brian Barrickman and Digging at Riverworks did the construction, and I have a bunch of photos of him that worked later, and then he used uh, TJ Concrete out of Carbondale um, for the forming up the structure and, and pouring the concrete. A huge list of uh, stakeholders. Um, of course, Healthy Rivers Board, Mid Valley Metro, Robinson were involved. The project is actually um, in Eagle County, and uh, access was through the town of Basalt, so they were involved in the permitting and access aspects. Um, we had a lot of input during the design uh, Kendall Backage from CPW provided um, some guidance on the fish passage and the habitat. Um, this is a commercially and recreationally boated reach of the Roaring Fork River, so we got a lot of great input from the Roaring Fork Fishing Guide Alliance, commercial rafting companies in the valley. Um, Roaring Fork Conservancy and the local Trout Unlimited chapter provided letters of support just to kind of help momentum for the project. And actually half the project is on CDOT property, and so um, Lisa primarily uh, worked with them to get uh, permits and access, which is always fun, you guys working with CDOT. Uh, funding was primarily um, through the Healthy Rivers Board and the fund they have through um, off the tax base, but we did get a, a large amount of money from the CWCB, uh, including the Water Supply Reserve Fund grant and the Colorado Water Plan grant. Got a Fishing is Fun uh, grant through CPW, and then the Robinson Ditch Company provided some uh, in-kind time, just stakeholder involvement, and then as well they paid for the design of the structural um, headgate structure. So here's kind of the, um, where the project is located. It's you know, right on the Eagle County, Pitkin County line. It is actually located in Eagle County, but um, the Healthy Rivers Board kind of charter is for the entire Roaring Fork watershed, and so that, that's how they got involved. Um, it's in between kind of El Tubel and Basalt, and here's a, another big project that the uh, Rivers Board did, the RISD, the Whitewater Park up there in Basalt. Um, so here's a kind of a zoom in, uh, pre-project conditions. It's just south of, uh, Highway 82, hence the CDOT involvement. Um, there's kind of a regional trail here that connects into the Rio Grande Trail, so there's a lot of vehicle traffic and pedestrian traffic we had to work with during construction. The south side of the bank is actually owned by the Obermeyer family of uh, clothing ski company fame, so we 
got to meet um, with those guys a couple times during the process, which was pretty cool. That was during COVID, so, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I promise this is one of the few slides I have with uh, words on it. Uh, just wanted to kind of summarize the needs. Um, and so the number one goal here was the, the passage for boats. Um, the, a lot of the longtime guys referred to this as um, Anderson Falls, and uh, a lot of them either did not run this stretch because of the structure, or they would stop upstream, let their clients out, line the boat through, and then get back in. They just didn't want to risk tipping. And a lot of them had stories of tipping clients in. And um, you all should go to the uh, Healthy Rivers Board website, and it's actually a feature project on the f Fishing is Fun website as well right now. The county put together this great video um, of the project, and a star of that is John Ely, the Pickton County attorney, and he tells this great story about him and his family getting stuck on it in a canoe with his kids. And I, I, he's a great storyteller. I can't do it justice, but it's worth um, one of the reasons why the county got involved in the project. And then um, we went out and did some velocity measurements. And we do feel like most fish are getting through here, particularly the trout that are made uh, in this stretch. But um, the measurements we made were kind of below the CPW fish passage you know, metrics that they pr provide. So maybe it's you know, a partial barrier for fish certain times of year and life cycles. Um, and then outside of the blockage area, it's just a, you know, kind of an unstable structure. It's basically just a pile of rocks. Um, and it would move every year. It would collect woody debris. Ice jams would get caught up on it. It's just you know, kind of a hazard in the river, and it would change every year. And then as a result of that, the dish company would need to go out and do maintenance, and then all the impacts associated with you know, them driving out in the river and moving rocks and cobble around. So I, I got some you know, photos of a prior project. This is a low water in early 2017. As you can see here, um, it's just you know, a pile of rocks, and there's really not a whole lot of ways to get through this section. Um, and then this is a, a river level. You know, again, you can just see that you know, there's really, a lot of times there was not a line through. Sometimes it was better than others, but most of the time you couldn't float through this stretch. And, it, and one of the reasons the stakeholders wanted to get, um, get this project involved, those who are familiar with the Roaring Fork kind of boating community, there's a lot of uh, pressure from Carbondale down to Glenwood. And so they felt like if they could get this uh, stretch open, the four or five miles um, floating through here, that it might relieve some of that pressure down valley. And here, uh, here's a high water. This is um, June of 2017. Um, and uh, boat pass is a little bit easier. A lot of the rocks get drowned out, but you really had to like know your line. And then it just collected a lot of debris, particularly on this left side, on the outside of the bend. Um, uh, There's rocks that were sticking way up out of the water there for no real reason. They would just collect things. And then over time, that just would you know, build up across the structure. And this is um, kind of river level. And so as you can see, there are passages through here, but you definitely needed a scout ahead of time because if you picked the wrong line, you could end up on a pour over over a boulder or something. So. And I, a couple slides just to kind of show the history and how this changed. Some of this was just from geomorphology and just um, over time, but a lot of it was because of maintenance. So the head gate is actually right here in this kind of blurry photo from 94. But the dam was actually completely upstream, and it would direct water into this kind of side channel and into the diversion. It's worth noting there was a big flow event in the valley in 95. In fact, part, part of Two Rivers Road, road fell into the river um, upstream of here. And so we think a lot of changes happened then. So this is uh, 10 years later. And so they've moved the diversion kind of downstream, you know, and it's still kind of directing water into here. You know, this is just kind of a sediment, and this is that old channel. Um, but it, it's just changed over time. And then this is right before we got started. And so the, the diversion dam is uh, pretty much still in the same place. But it's, at this point, it's actually not delivering water to the diversion. Um, it's um, they, they putting water in up here. And it's controlled by this riffle that would just change every year. And so at this point, it's a grade control, which is good. Basically, just a barrier in the river, which is, is not good. Um, and then um, right before we got into the final design, uh, the dish company had to go out and um, move some rocks around, and they ended up with this configuration, which basically you cannot float anything through this. A bunch of the local community got the paper involved. They ran a story on it. And sometimes, you know, bad news is good news because it really helped uh, get public support behind the project and really build momentum. We really needed it to kind of help us get across the finish line. So imagine trying to boat through that. It wouldn't be super fun. Um, so my second slide with words, I think this is the last one. And I won't read all of these, but this is kind of the opportunities and the constraints that we identified. And the one I wanted to highlight here was this strong relationship with the Valley Irrigators. The Ficken County Healthy Board, Rivers Board and then the stakeholders like really wanted to have that connection um, and just show there's a lot of structures in the watershed and in the region. They wanted to show that you could work with these irrigation companies, could work with the 
aquatic biologists and the recreators and develop a project that they still get their water, but then the project itself is just, you know, a benefit for everybody else. It doesn't need to be one purpose. And so we kind of view this as a, you know, pilot project for the area, particularly this is the high vis project, you know, on the main stem of the Roaring Fork. And so that was, you know, a key part of this was let's get this project done right and, and use this as an example. Um, so, uh, and she's not here, but actually Hattie Johnson made this when she was working with us. Um, this is a concept that we put together and this was used for like fundraising and stakeholder support and really just to start communicating with the public, you know, the expectations. We wanted to make sure people are aware that there was still going to be some white water in the stretch, you know, just because of the nature of the, of the slope of the project and how much room we had to work with. And so I think setting that expectation with the public is, um, is really important when it comes to like the white water recreation stuff. Um, and I uh, just wanted to kind of show how the design kind of translated into the plans. And I tried to highlight the key things in, in purple here. So we kept the, the grade control in place, but we lowered it like two and a half feet. So we left it there for grade control, but we really wanted to almost bury it in, in this engineered riffle that we put in. Same thing with the upper. We put in a, a grade control, buried in the river upstream. And that was to just kind of help maintain that pool elevation for the water delivery. And then if the irrigator did have to do maintenance, he could go out and he kind of had a template to follow. So he's not out just digging huge holes in the river uh, and then it not functioning when he's done. In between, we uh, put an engineer riffle. The nice thing was the slope that we were able to achieve uh, matched a lot of the riffle slopes upstream and downstream, which is important from a kind of a sediment transport and long-term viability of the project. Obviously things will change and this wasn't designed to be um, fixed in place in between here and it might adjust over time. Um, and, you know, we did grade a thaw egg in the middle just to kind of help promote that. We wanted that deep water passage for boats, you know, totally open so people could float through there. And then we put a lot of habitat elements, and you'll see in the later photos, um, on the sides, not only to provide that flow diversity and the refugia, but also to kind of help with the bed stability along the, uh, the banks where it was more important. The head gate got moved upstream um, to kind of where they're diverting right now anyway. We spent a lot of effort kind of placing that and getting the angle the right way work with SGM and the ditch company on that. Um, and of course, as a river engineer, I got to show you some modeling slides. And so this is a 2D SRH model that we created for the project. Um, the, uh, it's kind of a heat map. The cooler colors are slower velocities, uh, warmer colors are higher velocities. And uh, yeah, this kind of compares existing to proposed conditions. And you can see here, we've kind of distributed that head loss associated with a higher velocity over a bigger stretch versus having, you know, kind of and then a big drop at the bottom. We also use this model to help with the head gate placement. You know, it's on the inside of a bend, so some a sediment accumulation is inevitable, but we want to try to minimize that. And so we played around with this model a lot and how this little kind of point looked and how the head gate was, it was um, positioned. Um, one last modeling photo. So this um, kind of shows a comparison from the completed project to the model itself. And it's always, you know, the model's just a tool, obviously, it's one, one aspect of what you do to design a project, but it's always nice to see that the model's kind of producing, you know, similar results to what ends up being out there. This is the same flow rate and everything, and so you can kind of see there's, you know, higher velocity kind of down here as it goes over that bottom structure, and then some high, higher velocity in here as it goes over some habitat elements that we put in. So we were happy with how this turned out. Um, so I have a bunch of construction photos, and so as I mentioned, Brian Berkman uh, did the the construction and digging at river works. It's, as you guys know, and I think more with river projects than, than other types of civil projects, it's really important to have a contractor that you can work with and trust um, because, you know, you're not out there every day and there's a lot of things that come up during construction and, you know, the turbidity management, all those things associated with river projects. So to have a guy that knows what he's, or a person that knows what he's doing is important. And so Brian uh, recently upgraded his equipment um, to be machine controlled and you can see the GPS here, heads here on the top of his machine. And they actually um, uh, will tell him real time, like, you know, whatever tooth he spells out on his bucket, where that's at in the project. And so we provided him with a, a 3D mesh uh, of the project and all the line work. And so he could go out there and place his bucket and know exactly what material it should be, cut fill quantities and all that. It was super helpful, really helped streamline the process because um, it, it took a lot of the guesswork out. You know, there was almost no, like, he finished something, we go out and look at it, not like it, and he has to tear it out again. So it really helped with the quality control. Um, you know, it really put us more in kind of a construction observation role versus going out and checking every last thing that he did. And then it helped, um, again, with the uh, measurement and payment. You know, it was way harder to hide, like, extra boulders and things to try to, you know, as contractors tend to do. Um, 
Yeah, so I have a couple uh, photos of the construction. Um, this is that first stage where he's doing the river left. So actually he routed the entire Roaring Fork River at low flow um, through these culverts. We did wintertime construction, which it has a lot of advantages for river work. You know, that you're almost guaranteed low flows. Um, the freezing temperatures kind of help with erosion control and care of water and turbidity and things like that, which is always nice. Of course, I'm not out there working, you know, all day in, in 10 degree weather, so I can say that sitting here. Um, but, uh, you know, one downside, you had to be careful with like standing water in alluvium because that can freeze overnight and then can't move it the next day. And then on the Roaring Fork, there's always a potential of an ice jam event. Um, up in Snowmass Canyon, when it gets really cold, ice will form and then you have a warm week and it'll flush down uh, into basalt. And we did have a small one during construction, but not too bad. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, so this is the second uh, phase of construction. So the river left stuff is done. So he's able to like put the river back in the natural channel. So, you know, the fish passes and things can occur. At this point, he's building the coffer dam um, for the uh, second phase, which is kind of this middle part of the project. It is nice. We were able to, um, you know, because we lowered that diversion down the two and a half, three feet, there was a lot of boulder that we could reuse um, in, this, in the boulder structures that we did install. And that is helpful because as you guys know, like at this point, importing boulder um, is getting very expensive and it's almost cost prohibitive on some projects. So the most, uh, uh, we tried to minimize the amount of boulder that we imported on the project and, and use what was there. And the nice thing was on this project, we had a, a lot of material. And then Lisa somehow has a collection of boulders that she's just, <laughs> she's like, oh yeah, I got some in this yard over here. That's, that's always helpful too. And you can kind of see, so this is where the river was. So he's pulling these coverts out right now. And this, so this is where the channel was during that first stage. Um, and, uh, and he's, you know, pulling this apart and, and flopping the river over. I will say, I, I, I imagine most of you guys at this point use it, but there's a lot of drone photos in here. The, with drones with river work, it's pretty amazing how helpful it is just to get up a couple hundred feet off the ground, kind of look down, and I would recommend, you know, getting that involved in your project development because it really helps tell the story to, you know, fund the whole stakeholders and fundraisers and all those things. So um, I, we end up using it a lot. So just a couple of photos of the actual head gate structure. This is um, nine feet below the riverbed, so probably 12 feet below where the water level is on the backside of this coffer dam. Fortunately, I didn't get a, didn't get a photo of that. But um, so, the, you know, a giant hole in the river that we put this thing down in. And that was, you know, to, you know, most of this is going to be buried, but we wanted it, you know, to be stable structurally. And then if scour or things occurred during a high water event, we make sure it didn't get undermined. Um, you know, the one, uh, Wintertime construction kind of helped with water coming through this coffer dam because the concrete, you know, basically had to curve for thir four, uh, 30 days. So the um, Brian had to use, you know, dewatering and all those things for 30 days, which is a long time to keep something like this dry when it's that far below the riverbed. Um, and, the, you know, one downside to pouring concrete in the wintertime is he had to use, um, for the first couple of weeks, use heating blankets to help with curing. So he's got some good stories of, uh, you know, being out there at 2 in the morning and the river's like 10 feet above his head and uh, he's trying to check these blankets, make sure they work. And um, so there's, there's downsides to wintertime construction. And so this is that uh, final stage. So basically the river work is done. He's got an alluvium kind of coffer dam in there just to kind of help with our turbidity. You know, the structure's done and backfilled and he's kind of working on this, what we refer to as the island in between the, the ditch inlet and the river itself. Um, so this is uh, kind of the finished project. I actually just flew this last week. Um, and I just wanted to kind of show the different elements. So you can kind of see the grade controls, at least the hydraulic influence of them, right here and right here. And here's that riffle in between. You can kind of see the thawway connecting the two. And then, you know, we really on the sides of this, we put in a lot of habitat elements, kept it shallow just, um, you know, for the, the fish aspect. Um, and then, you know, here's the head grate structure. You know, we moved it upstream. Here's the um, existing one. We actually left the concrete in place just to keep that stable and just pulled the hardware off. And then, um, you know, I think the biggest risk to this project is a, a high water event, you know, where a hundred year event is basically, you know, from terrace to terrace here. And so we put a lot of elements in to, you know, if this did overtop, you know, we wanted to provide an out for that water. So it did just didn't start tearing up their ditch. That's kind of what this structure is right here. It's an overflow. Um, you know, just because of Picking County's dedication and also the, 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 some of the permit requirements, they committed themselves to a, a five year monitoring effort. And so um, every year we go out and take water surface measurements, um, you know, during runoff and through the hydrograph. In the fall during low water, we go out and uh, survey cross sections through here. And so it's been really interesting, you know, from my perspective, uh, just to be able to formally do that. You know, like most of you, 
most of my post construction monitoring involves me like stopping on a road trip, which my wife really loves. Um, so I want to thank Lisa for helping me with the relationship as well. Um, but uh, so it's been nice to be able to go out and kind of see what this project it does and how it's changing over time. Um, so this is just after construction, and you know Brian's up here cleaning up right now and kind of finishing up, uh, cleaning up the staging area. So there's you know all the, the willows and everything are kind of planted there, but you can't really even see them yet, um, and they haven't even put water in the ditch yet at that point. Um, so this is um, a couple months later, uh, post runoff. You know, in the Roaring Fork watershed, it's pretty much snowmelt driven. Your high flow every year is going to be in that June, if it's a big water year, early July time frame. So that's kind of the, the big time when things happen in this stretch of the Roaring Fork. And so this is um, after the first runoff. It was pretty small runoff. It was about 1,700 CFS. And so there wasn't any, uh, you know, a lot of huge changes in the channel. You can still see the thawweg here and the habitat elements. Um, and uh, we're starting to see some vegetation grow up on the bank, so it's only been a couple months, so it, it does take time. And then uh, I just flew this, um, gosh, like two weeks ago, and, uh, and so this um, is after the second runoff season, a little bit bigger water year, 2,300 CFS. But you can see, so there has been some um, sediment movement below these structures, so that these are a little bit, you know, hydraulics a little bit bigger. Um, and we are starting to see some really good willow growth on the downstream and kind of this island. Uh, we're, we're wanting to get more here. We, Lisa and I were talking about maybe getting a crew out there to put some more willows in along this upper bank. Um, in general, the disc company wanted us to keep willows like out of their in ditch inlet, so we're going to focus those on the river itself. Yeah, and then this is kind of a last picture um, looking upstream, um, so you can really see kind of how the habitat elements work in the thawweg and the slope of the ripple and everything. And you know, I think the long-term goal is that, you know, you float through this reach and unless you, you know, if you, if you don't see the, the big concrete structure up here, you know, most of this, you know, looks somewhat similar to what you see everywhere else. You know, our goal is to have folks float through this reach and not really know they've gone through a diversion structure. So I think over time, as the vegetation grows in and, and things kind of adjust, we get more and more that way. Yeah, so that's all I have. Is there any questions for me? I'm not sure how long that took, but I always tend to talk faster up here. Sweet. All right. Any uh, any questions for me? Yes, sir. Scott. Yeah, so it's your water right? Oh, I knew you were going to ask me that. I want to say it's like 40 <laughs> CFS, so it's a pretty big amount, and it's kind of a unique ditch because it historically it was a lot further upstream, and then it kind of had to get adjusted as they put the bypass in in the 80s and 90s, and um, they they're they have several cleanouts like a quarter mile downstream on the ditch. So there's actually no local return right here, which I think helped us in our design. We didn't have to account for that. But I, I think it's like 40 CFS, but don't don't hold me to that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, any, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, you know, they, um, you know, Bill Reynolds is the, uh, kind of our point contact, and he works for Mid Valley Metro and is also the president of Robinson Ditch Company. And he was, you know, great to work with. You know, definitely, it was a process to get them on board. I think it helped that Pekin County was writing the checks for the most part. Um, but uh, I think the biggest surprise to me was, um, like, they didn't really realize that the boulders weren't really putting water in their ditch anymore. Like they were going out every year and maintaining those, you know, not really looking at, oh, I'm not even, this isn't even, you know, controlling the water going into my ditch. So it, it was nice to help them kind of educate them on the, on the process. And there was a lot of back and forth. And we, you know, spent a lot of time out in the field looking at things just to get them on board. And I think it's gone well. They actually own the next um, diversion downstream. And we're already talking about, you know, working on that there by Hook's Bridge. I, I think it went well. Um, I don't know if that answered the question completely, but uh, okay, yeah, no problem. Anybody else? Yeah, 
because a lot of those, that's a great point, Lisa, a lot of those, a lot of those, I mean, they have been around for a long time, and there's a lot of, like, just corporate knowledge on, you know, we've always done it this way, and they don't like to change things. So I think kind of convincing them that, hey, we can still get you your water, but, you know, we can kind of benefit the river users, uh, both the fish and the boaters at the same time is helpful. Yes, ma'am. Correct. I mean, obviously, nothing's ever going to be maintenance-free, but we tried to focus. Let me uh, go back on the slide here. Um, we tried to focus their maintenance uh, just at the head gate itself. You know, if they got sediment accumulation or debris piled up here, you know, it is kind of on the inside of a bend, so these things tend to end up there. And so we provided them with an access point where they can come down, and it's all hardened right here, and they can, you know, hopefully not even put their tracks in the river, just reach down pull out the sediment in front of the head gate. So the, the goal was to like keep, remove the need for them to be out here and tracking all up and down the river and, and making big changes. Yeah. And you know, and, and I'm not a um, vegetation expert, and in the past, you know, I, I think our goal has been, to, like you said, get that water slowed down and then you get that seed deposit during runoff and things. And, and we just want to, you know, try to encourage as much as possible just because you know, we don't want this kind of, you know, big bare, bare spot that's, you know, just three to one side slope, you know, kind of look. We want to get the vegetation going. And I think it also helps kind of help shade the river as well and, and, and the habitat perspective. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, it is from, I think, pretty typical. It's like April 15th to October 15th kind of time frame. And so that was the other advantage to working in the wintertime. We did not have to... Um, deal with that because you know I'm working on other projects right now where we're having to deliver water during construction which always presents challenges um, the uh, CFS to gallon per minute on a pump that gets pretty big pretty quickly Yeah, so 2021 was a pretty low um, water year, and uh, they didn't have any issues. You know, the, this um, control structure creates a pretty big pool here, and then this riffle kind of helps direct water into their ditch. And um, but we, you know, I'm, you know, over time, obviously, that might change. But you know, for you know, what this project hasn't seen is a really big runoff year yet. So we're kind of waiting um, for that to see if it's really tested from a stability perspective. And so far, the you know, the water delivery has gone well. Just talking with Bill and his crew. Yeah, please. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys. Okay, so we've got three people. There's three of you guys, right? Yep. Um, that are going to be presenting next. Um, and Julie Knudsen, that is how you pronounce your last name, right, Julie? Knudsen. Julie Knudsen, I did not get that right. Um, anyway, um, uh, Julie has uh, claimed to have a huge affinity for ologist roles, and it's true, and so I expected her to be very old when I saw her, but <laughs> she's not. And then I also realized that I know her, but I just, you know, it's one of those things, and it's from meeting her at, at, at some of these conferences. So, um, so her list is restoration ecologist, hydrologist, botanist, soil scientist, weed manager, staff scientist, and consultant. Yeah, I know, but I just am sorry I'm going to do this to her. Um, but anyway, um, so she's also been an educator in academia, um, and she hasn't been content to work in Colorado. She's done work in Montana and Alaska. One of her main passions is helping to build bridges and understanding between rural ag and urban perspectives and between academic knowledge and traditional experiential knowledge. So really great. Her background as a trained scientist with a PhD from CSU and work as a land manager along with her family ag background has motivated her. So she strongly supports all who are working to build collaboration between diverse partners for the long-term benefit of watersheds. So welcome Julie. And um, do you want me to just introduce you guys separately as you come up or? Do you want to just get it over with? <laughs> no. Okay, let's do that. <laughs> Sorry. No. <laughs> <I know. laughs> All right. So when then next is Olympia 
Vida, and everybody, that's how you pronounce Vida, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Welcome, Olympia. Nice to meet you, finally. Um, she works with Mile High Youth Corps, currently where she's, she began with leading a backpacking trail crew in the summer of 2018 and a chainsaw crew in the fall. <laughs> so, she, uh, yeah, she's a lot tougher than she looks. <laughs> Um, she then served as their program coordinator for a year. She then spent time at the Rocky Mountain Field Institute on a high alpine trail project on Kit Carson Peak and then joined the Forest Service as a wildland firefighter. Um, she's much tougher than she looks. <laughs> she returned to Mile High Youth Corps in February 2022 to become project coordinator of, Southern, of the Southern Front Range where she um, contributes to youth development, helping them explore all things natural resource management-esque. <laughs> So next, Carrie. Welcome, Carrie. Um, she's COO of the Arkansas Watershed Collaborative, helping to manage project programs and grants and a host of related responsibilities. She's a pas passionate cartographer and GIS specialist, um, especially moved by st the stories that maps can tell like no other medium. So welcome to the three of you. Thank you. I'll take it away. Hello, um, and you're gonna keep time on us, right? Because we found out all three of us are talkers. <laughs> um, so yes, thank you for being here today. Um, we are very excited to share with you a project we've been working on down in Southeast Colorado. Um, it's, it's a huge effort of 20 different partners, two sister watersheds doing fuels mitigation work um, across U.S. Forest Service lands and city lands um, in both of our upper headwaters. Um, and uh, the alternate title was why 33 acres and breakfast burritos are really important, um, which you will find out. Um, but yeah, so um, to start, um, just an overview, we'll talk about the partners briefly, um, a project overview, accomplishments, and then we thought it would be great to share with you our different perspectives and lessons learned um, from the Mile High Youth Corps perspective and our two different nonprofits. Um, so really quick, uh, Purgatory and Kucharis, those are the two sister watersheds. Uh, 33 acres of land, um, 20 plus diverse partners working across jurisdictional boundaries, which we're doing with feds and city and state, because uh, the Colorado State Forest Service was involved. It was, it was a lot of moving parts. Um, we engaged 41 community stewards and accomplished 1.25 miles of roadway work. Um, and these are t the two main roads, um, the Purgatory Campground Road and also the Kucharis Road. A lot of people go up and recreate there in the summer, but when a fire would start, this would be their only way out. So these are both really critical roadways. These are our partners. Of course, none of this would have been possible without our funders. Um, and this is one of the neat parts of the story, the 33 acres. We all rallied together um, to apply for National, for, uh, National Forest Foundation uh, funding there on the bottom. So it was very exciting um, that they funded us. And then we were able to go on and use this project and that funding to leverage up and get even bigger projects and work going on. We've got what, like 100, 2,550 acre project going now and more and more funding. Um, and so it's really snowballed and we've been really excited about that. So 33 acres can multiply quickly. Um, so just quick background on the Purgatory Watershed Partnership. We're a nonprofit based in Trinidad, but working throughout the Purgatory River watershed. Um, the Arkansas Basin Roundtable is the roundtable that we tie into, obviously. We do education, restoration work, and we have a lot of local, regional, um, and national partners. Uh, these are just some programs. Um, and I will turn it over to Carrie to talk about our work. The Arkansas River Watershed Collaborative um, 
we work to protect and improve watershed health throughout the basin. We support locally driven initiatives and implement uh, implementation of projects. We also assist communities in identifying, prioritizing, developing, and implementing projects, which we did here, and we support the development of collaborative stakeholder engagement, which is another part of our, and you can see um, the purgatory watershed is on the bottom, but then the Werfenau watershed is in there, but that's our whole basin. And then, that kind of, went over to each other, but what I, our focus areas are, like I said, stakeholder engagement. We do water quality, water quantity. We focus on forest health and post-fire recovery. So I like to say that we work before a wildfire and after. Hi everyone, my name's Olympia Vita. I am the project coordinator at the Mile High Youth Corps. Our headquarters are in Denver, but we have a satellite office in Colorado Springs known as the Southern Front Range Office, or SFR, which is where I work out of. Uh, we are a part of AmeriCorps, the National Community Service Branch of the government, and as such, our employees who serve on field projects are called Corps members. Our mission is to help youth make a difference in themselves and their community through meaningful service opportunities and educational experiences. At the Mile High Youth Corps, we believe that supporting the development of young adults ages 20, 18 to 24 has long-term impacts on individuals, community, and the environment. For 30 years now, we have combined meaningful paid service opportunities in various career pathways uh, with education to help young adults discover their strengths and learn how to lead. Our career pathways include land conservation, which I am a part of, energy and water conservation, health and wellness, and construction. We serve 23 counties in Southeast Colorado and our land conservation program engages youth in conservation-based work focused on environmental improvements on public lands. Participants work on small crews, typically eight in size for the duration of their AmeriCorps term, which ranges anywhere between three months to a year. Work performed by the crews include uh, increasing accessibility for the public, restoring native habitats, and mitigating the effects of catastrophic wildfires and floods. In SFR, we are hosting six crews this fall, a majority of which are overnight crews. They camp four or nine days at a time in both front and back country settings. And we call these camping trip hitches. We have three hand crews that perform trail and fence work. And we have three saw crews performing invasive species removal and fire mitigation, and one of those saw crews is also trained in pesticide application. Thank you. So one of the reasons why this project with ARWIC and PWP was so successful was because of their focus on the educational component. So through Mile High, Corps members receive well-rounded curriculum focused on environmental stewardship, civic engagement, healthy living, career readiness, leadership and social justice, not to mention the technical training that they receive at the beginning of their terms. Uh, the technical training includes tool safety and risk management, trail construction, plant species ID, first aid and CPR, and the S212 wild and fire chainsaw class for our saw crews. Education at Mile High takes place primarily in the field uh, with three hours designated per week for, uh, for education. And fortunately, these sessions are often led by the partners, like Julie and Carrie, uh, who volunteer to do so. If partners don't have the capacity to lead activities in the field, the core will supplement curriculum for the crews to do themselves, and they all fall under the six categories listed above. Uh, and we feel that many of our educational programs line up with PWP's educational values, and again, that's why this project was so successful. So. Uh, with me. So having said all that, I will give a brief summary of our role in this project. So we had a saw crew for one week in the summer working on the Kucharis watershed and another saw crew in the fall working for three weeks on the Purgatory watershed. In addition to learning how to use the chainsaw uh, at, during their technical trainings, these core members also learned how to use a chipper on site and became familiar with specific wildfire mitigation strategies thanks to the partners being on site so regularly. And that includes PWP, ARWIC, and the US Forest Service. 
Uh, I'm going to pass it on to Carrie next to talk about the project on uh, from a larger from a larger perspective. We're going to switch to a video. It's not showing up on the screen. Yeah, maybe hit escape on the other um, presentation. So while they're doing that, um, for context and background on our project in the area, I'm going to be showing you a camera style fly through over um, some imagery, some satellite imagery of the watersheds and the project. 